Okay, good evening everyone. This is Nancy Howell and our March bird quiz is up there on the screen. Hopefully you took a few minutes. That's all it probably took for uh, answering these couple of fun questions. So we're, we all are going to be going through our quiz lately, later, um, but I think we have our hostess with the mostess this evening. Michelle, are you ready? Uh, yes, I am here. Um, so, yes, welcome to today's uh, speaker series meeting. Uh, my name is Michelle Brocious. I am a WCAS board member and field trip co coordinator, uh, and I will be taking over as host this evening as Nancy, who is our usual host for the speaker series, is presenting our featured program for us tonight. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Ah, it's me again. How about that? Um, well, we have, a, 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 again, some fun things coming up uh, this evening. And uh, I just want to, again, welcome everyone. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, Betsy. All righty. Are you ready for those bird quiz answers? You could type in the answer in the chat if you'd like, but the very first question was about ostriches. And, and let me just back up a little bit. Um, when we talked about the, the questions, the word ratite came up. Those are generally large, flightless birds uh, that do not have a keel on their breastbone. The keel, if you're not familiar with bird anatomy, if you've ever eaten a uh, breast of a chicken, the meat that's stuck on that big old bone that sticks out, that's the keel. And these birds, ratites, do not have a keel because that's where the flight muscles would be attached. And they don't fly. So, so let's uh, go to our, our first uh, qu question dealt with uh, a large birds uh, in uh, the ostriches and what con continent you would find ostriches in their natural habitat. Next slide. And that is in the African continent. Yay! Alrighty. Our second question dealt with the raptite that is found in South America. Did anybody get the rhea? And let's see if we have a picture of that bird. Let's see, next slide, please. That is the South American ratite. And you can see it's a little smaller than an ostrich. They do like open areas, the pampas, like in Argentina. And look at that cute face. Look at those, all those feathers. Big eyes, too. All right, back to the, to the uh, answer page. Betsy, please. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but there is a ratite, a very large one. People say that they can eviscerate a human. They probably can. They've got big old toenails on their feet, and that's the cassowary, the cassowary. So let's go on down two slides. Okay, there you go. There's the cassowary, and that uh, big mm -hmm. thing on its head, and you see on the right, it's called the task and supposedly uh, if the bird is dashing through rainforest through forest um, that will help kind of brush away the, the plant material but it's also been found that it's been used for helping to uh, get sound uh, expressed a little bit louder because you know if you're in a rainforest the sound is deadened so if you're calling for a mate or calling for a territory you want to get that sound out there all right, let's go back to our quiz answers, please. And the main Australian rat type is the emu. And for those of you who watch television, I think you probably are familiar with and a famous emu, uh, the Liberty Mutual emu. And that's what they look like. 
Look at that. Look at that funny looking hair on or feathers on the on the right. So cute. A uh, question came up. Um, who is the partner with that Limu Emu on the on the ad? Does anybody know? Let's see if somebody puts the answer in. Well, it's Limu Emu and. I guess nobody watches TV. Doug, so <laughs> you'll watch, I'm sure you'll watch <laughs> again and, and pay more, much closer attention. All right, and the final question, the final question, and final we'll go back to our, how come I'm getting feedback? All right, the kiwi is the rat type that has a green fuzzy fruit named for it. So the kiwi is not a big bird, but of course flightless. And let's get a picture of that kiwi. Betsy, thanks so much for moving our slides around. This is awesome. <gasps> there we are. There's the kiwi that moves around. And there's some kiwi eggs. See, they're green and fuzzy. No, those are not kiwi eggs. Those are the fruit of the, of the kiwi. So kiwi berries is what they are. Um, I think just about everybody likes kiwis. And kids like kiwis as well, too. The fruit, not, maybe not the birds. All right. Thanks ever so much, Betsy. Good job. And thank you, Michelle. All right. Next slide, please. All right. So it's back to me. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I would first like to introduce our board members attending this evening. You have already met Nancy Howell. Also joining us today is Marianne Romito. Please give a little wave when I call your name. Uh, Karu uh, Subon. Hi, Karu. And Kurt Miski. Hi, Kurt. And I think that's it for the board members attending tonight. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so in-person activities, including our bird walks, continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. However, Bill Dininger and Dave Grass Kemper are still going out for the canceled second Saturday bird walks to collect bird survey data for eBird. On the February 2021 second Saturday bird walk, the weather was cold starting at 23 degrees and ending at 26 degrees. 20 species were observed. Woodpeckers were seen throughout the trail, uh, and there was a bald eagle flyover. There was also a multitude of American robins. The best bird, however, was a barred owl tucked in a pine tree. Next slide, please. All right, the February virtual field trip. So last month, our virtual field trip was at Bradley Woods Reservation in Westlake in search of the black-capped chickadee. At least six participants visited the park throughout the month. I'm currently compiling the bird list, journaling, and photos submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't sent me your items, please get those over to me by end of day Friday, March 5th. That's this Friday. I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, March 10th at 7 p.m. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the park last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup, in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Next slide. All right, and uh, March's virtual field trip takes place at North Chagrin Reservation, where, where we'll be looking for the red-winged blackbird. The suggested site to see the blackbirds is Oxbow Lagoon, just south of Squires Castle on Chagrin River Road. However, please feel free to explore the other sites in the reservation. Squires Castle is also a fun site from which you can observe birds. The Nature Center is closed, but the surrounding trail, Sunset Pond, and Sanctuary Marsh nearby are also a great place to look for birds. Please study a map before your visit. A Google search for the address to North Sugar Reservation will give you a Psalm Center Road address, but this address will not take you to the right place if using a GPS. At least it didn't for me. Instead, follow the address for the Nature Center, which is a Buttermilk Falls Parkway. This will get you to the Nature Center. Axbow Lagoon doesn't have an address that I was able to find. Instead, follow the address for Squares Castle and know the lagoon is just south of there. <coughs> 
Uh, during your visit to the park, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Uh, take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen. Tally identified species, journal your thoughts, or create a poem or a haiku. Send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the Virtual Field Trips 2021 tile on the home page. All right, next slide, please. Social distancing birding guidelines. Uh, as you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by limiting your group size to 10 people or less, staying six feet apart from others not in your household, traveling separately, wearing a face mask and washing your hands or using a high alcohol hand sanitizer. All right, next slide, please. All right, so follow us on social media. Uh, please stay connected with us in between these virtual meetups on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I have recently started moderating our Instagram page and have launched a fun activity for featuring a bird photo of the day. Simply use hashtag WC Audubon and when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. All right, next slide, please. All right, next up is Betsy O'Hagan, our web and marketing strategist with some program updates. Take it away, Nancy, or uh, Betsy, sorry. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to speak just for a moment about the Guardians of Nature program and introduce the photography winner for the February month and introduce the contest, the photography contest for March. The Guardians of Nature program is an outreach and public education pro program that uh, engages the public, uh, engages birders, members, guests, friends, anyone is invited. The sessions are um, twice a month the third and fourth Thursdays of every month generally uh, at 7 p.m. And uh, we go there to talk about different projects that are going on. Uh, people can volunteer, bring their ideas. Um, you can bring your ideas for projects. Uh, and we also have plenty of existing projects to work on and volunteer opportunities, such as the Bluebird um, nesting box project, which you'll hear about in just a second, and uh, native plant sales. Also, for example, the initiative that Michelle Brocious just spoke about, the social media um, campaigns and, and activities there. So do join us. Uh, you don't need to be a member to join. It's at no charge. It's not a ticketed event. But we do ask you to register so we can give you a warm welcome. This is the winning photograph for the month of February. Every month, uh, WCIS hosts a, uh, a um, photographic contest. And uh, this month, uh, it was taken by Anna Kozlenko. And Anna, I know you're here. If you can, just take a moment and say hello. And maybe give us a moment or two um, to tell, tell us about all and unmute you. Tell us about your picture and where it was taken. I, let's see. Can you unmute yourself? <laughs> All right. Hang on just a moment. I'll see if I can do that. Okay. No, I did. Fine. Oh, good. Okay. Good. This picture taken in a lake uh, in um, East Lake. It was East Lake Eagles. Uh, it's kind of famous couple for a while, and uh, they even have a, a special uh, Facebook page and lots of followers and people. Mm -hmm. They even have names: uh, ju uh, Justice and Kindness. And uh, people collect money. It was a group which is kind of affiliated with them and they collect money to put the camera above the nest. 
but unfortunately, uh, like we come on February, yeah, last year before COVID scare and everything, and I took this picture, and it was I had several pictures, and it's couple there on the nest, and this one is just like <laughs> pose of it, and um, well. I have, I don't have like expensive professional camera or anything. This is um, Nikon P900. This is the camera which I have. So it's point and shoot, but it has a big zoom like this. That's what I have. It's lighter than this big lenses and everything, but it works well in good uh, light and if it's not that far away. So that's what I'm using. And um, what happened, we come later, probably in March, and there was a people, it was a couple, husband and wife, they're monitoring this nest and uh, they're actually eagle chasers, they're monitoring several different nests. And it was not nothing on the nest, nobody there. And we asked, what, and this couple was there too, and we asked them what happened. He says, uh, well, it was a tragedy, it was five eagles come there and fight. And they killed the male. And uh, female just uh, left, and everybody left, this, like they left the nest. And then younger male come, and they kind of join together with this female later, probably a week later. And now, what I know now, that this old female and new male, they build another nest uh, in different place, not too far from this place, but I, they even show on the Facebook where the nest is, but I didn't have time to get there, but I, I want to get there. Maybe it will be opportunity to take another picture. So that's my story about this picture. Well, thank you so much. I didn't expect to get any, any you know, <laughs> winning because I'm not, I am kind of don't have really good, you know, uh, camera or anything. So <laughs> it's kind of a surprise. Well, well, thank you for entering. Um, the judges said it was just a great shot. It was well done. It was all in focus. Uh, it's crisp. They love the expression of the bird and the action going on, the, the whole dynamic of the photograph. Uh, they also love that you showed the nest more than just the, just the bird. The highlights, the range of shadows, the uh, range of grays, and the general wow. composition. So thank you so much. Thank you. And just before I finish, um, I'll give you a couple of pointers on the March photo contest. The featured bird is the turkey vulture. The contest uh, goes during the month of March. And we're going to close at the very last day of March, the 31st. Uh, winners will be announced at the next speaker meeting, April 6th on Tuesday. Uh, youth and adult categories both are $5 each photo. And uh, we'll have an annual yearly contest in January of 2022 for all of the winners uh, from the previous months. And donations support chapter conservation education. If you want to learn more, just go to the homepage of wcaudubon.org and look for the navigational button there, and it'll take you to the announcement and the details and how to enter. I hope you do. All right. Thank you, Betsy. Um, next up is board member Kurt Miske to talk about our Bluebird Box project. Good evening. As most of you know, uh, WCAS has the Gene Miske Memorial Fund, which is dedicated towards birding boxes, Bluebird Boxes, 
and we will be replacing five boxes at the Lewis Road Ring, Lewis, yeah, Horse Ring, uh, Riding, there they go, Riding Ring. Uh, that will happen later this month. Uh, I have four volunteers so far that will be monitoring, and training for them will be later this month. So a lot's going to happen in the, the next uh, couple, three weeks. The boxes should be open at that point, and we'll be monitoring them on a weekly basis, probably twice a week, actually, uh, trying to keep out those nasty house sparrows and keeping the bluebirds and the tree swallows in. So uh, donations can be made online. Just hit the button and go for it. We're doing uh, a one-for-one one on that. So everything you give is uh, doubled. I think that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, next up is Amanda Sabrowski, founder of Northeast Ohio Chimney Swift Conservation, to give us an update on her organization's projects. Hmm. Ah, okay. Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, well, the Chimney Swift should start returning sometime next month, and we're really looking forward to their helping us with the mosquitoes. Um, they spend literally most of their life on the wing catching insects the size of mosquitoes and midges. And um, their Chimney Swift populations have declined uh, since the 70s by over 70%, and a major cause is habitat loss which is something we can help them with. Um, we can uh, preserve the chimneys in the old buildings and we can build towers. They um, use the chimneys for nesting as well as gathering in the fall before they go to South America. And the flocks can be quite large, so it's really important to save the chimneys from the old buildings. Um, it really is important for their survival. Uh, next, next. Um, Slide, please. Okay. Um, Lehigh Valley Audubon Society in um, East, Eastern Pennsylvania is uh, working to help keep a chimney um, that's on the Masonic Temple in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Next slide. The um, owner of the Masonic Temple is John Noble. He's also the developer, and he's pledged to save the old chimney when he tears down the temple, and if he can't save it, he'll put up a new one. Uh, next slide. And this is just a picture of the project. You can see it's really quite large, and in the kind of left center, that's the chimney that they're uh, going to try and save. Um, next slide. The uh, cost of the project is $50,000. Not sure why it's so much, but they're trying to raise uh, $50,000 through a GoFundMe site called Save Our Swifts. So if you're so inclined, um, we hope you'll consider giving money to their GoFundMe to uh, help save this chimney. And if you'd like to help put up uh, chimney or uh, towers here in Northeast Ohio, you could go to wcaudubon.org and click on the Chimney Swift Projects button, and it'll be used to um, repair and put up towers in Northeastern Ohio. We've already put up or repaired or um, um, contributed to four Chimney Swift Towers, and we're hoping that uh, we'll get a couple more projects as soon as the COVID is over. There's uh, some Boy Scouts that are um, thinking about putting up some towers. Thanks. All right, thank you, Amanda. And next up is Board Member Carew to provide an update on our Native Plant Sale Initiative for this year. Hi, thank you, uh, Michelle. Hi, everyone. This is Kaoru Tsubone, a bird-friendly native plant sale committee. Uh, as you know, bird of, uh, native plants are very important for birds' habitat. Uh, it's like our home or food. 
So we would like to have native sales brand this year too. And a little bit to talk about uh, the native brand sale in the past. We had uh, two bird friendly native brand sale to in 2019. Uh, one is at Seville and another was uh, at uh, Tremont. And uh, last year we uh, didn't uh, have one have uh, any of them because of COVID-19. So, uh, but uh, uh, fortunately, uh, we can try something like maybe online or at the farmer's market. So, if you are interested in uh, helping us uh, for this uh, uh, very friendly native plant sale, uh, please join us. Like. As Beto say already said, we have guardians of nature meetings uh, twice in a month, so uh, we can talk about uh, uh, this matter as well. And also, you can reach, out, reach me out uh, with uh, uh, email or phone number or, uh, of course, a website. So, uh, yeah, even you won't be able to uh, attend the meeting, you can give us your idea or opinion. Those are so helpful. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Karu. All right. So uh, back to me to talk about uh, or Mitchell's ice cream fundraiser and becoming a member. Next slide. Oh, next slide, please. All right, so um, we are selling Mitchell's ice cream gift cards in $10 denominations. In addition to ice cream, Mitchell has frozen yogurt, sorbet, and vegan ice cream. I'm told that the vegan ice cream is delicious. Uh, my family has a Sunday night tradition of enjoying Mitchell's ice cream, so I have definitely purchased some of these cards. And if you are interested in starting your own tradition or if there are any birthdays or events coming up, uh, these cards are perfect for that. Uh, please visit our store to purchase and visit mitchellshomemade.com to find the nearest Mitchells near you. Next slide, please. All right, so our April speaker series program, uh, next month's speaker series program is Cute Chicks, presented by Carrie Elvey, a senior naturalist and community engagement coordinator at the Wilderness Center. So please join us again on April 6th at 7.30 p.m. here at the WCAS Virtual Conference Center. All right, next slide, please. All right, so uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's feature presentation, What is that bird doing? Feeding behavior, presented by Nancy Howell and Bill Dininger. Uh, they will be taking us through Bill's video, so please have patience with possible video playback slowdowns, depending on your home internet traffic, and please be patient and allow for buffering. Also, we do ask that you save your questions to the end of the program, but please feel free to write them in the chat for us to respond to when we can. And with that, Nancy and Bill, please take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Uh, I'm Nancy Howell. You already heard from Bill, who did these fabulous videos. And we're going to be co-presenting. But I also want to mention that Betsy O'Hagan uh, is the editor of our presentation. And what we've chosen to do is to take a look at, at bird behaviors. Um, and we're looking at feeding behavior. So what's that bird doing? Well, we're going to be checking out uh, different birds feeding. Um, as you know, that bird beaks are a, have a wonderful variety of styles. There are beaks that are so specialized that the birds are only eating certain things. Then there are birds that have beaks that are generalist. You know, they can eat a wide variety of items. So I think, you know, you're, you're familiar with things like flamingos, which are a very highly specialized beak. And then, yeah, so you have things like house sparrows that eat just about anything from breadcrumbs to insects to bird seed to suet 
you know, that type of stuff. So, again, bird beaks are amazing things. And we're not just going to look at their beaks, but also um, think about their, their tongue, their whole mouth, and, and what it has to do. Uh, I'm sure glad I have hands that I can use, but just think if you had to build a nest, roll your eggs around, feed yourself, feed your young, take care of your body, your feathers. Again, a beak is an amazing thing. And bird beak can also be used for identification. So if we can get the next slide up, please. Uh, for example, uh, we have a vireo on the left and a warbler on the right. Uh, the vireo is a warbling vireo with a kind of a heavy, thick beak with a hook at the end. Whereas the Tennessee warbler, uh, very thin beak, thin and pointed. And you might say, well, I'm not going to see that out in the field. Yes, you can. If you're out there, you'll notice, oh, my goodness, thin beak, mm, can't be a vireo. Thick beak, ah, with a hook at the end, must be a vireo. So beaks can really, really be helpful in, uh, in identification. All right, so we're going to get into our videos. And uh, as Bill mentioned, we may have, or, or maybe as Michelle mentioned, we may have a little a uh, difference in, in the speed because of the um, uh, your, your computer networking, uh, but we hope that the people will enjoy uh, the videos and Bill will join in uh, with some colorful commentary as well. So let's move on to our very first category. Yep, look at that beautiful wood duck. Alrighty, so when people think waterfowl, maybe everybody thinks, oh yeah, they're in water, they're going to be eating fish, but uh, not so. So let's take a look at some of these first couple of videos. Uh, we'll have Ross's goose and Canada goose videos. The Ross's goose is um, a, looks a little bit like a snow goose, but just watch it feeding. So it, as well as Canada geese, uh, somewhere maybe in a park, on a golf course, um, you know, in a neighborhood. Um, I call it, it, it looks like they're, they're like feathered cattle. They're just, you know, grazing along. They are grass eaters. So let's go to our, our next video, please. Here again, we have a Ross's goose in the winter along with some Canada geese. Again, watch them as they're feeding. They're in the grass. They're eating grasses and forbs, things like uh, uh, clover and dandelion greens and things like that. I know people do not like geese moving around their, their golf courses and parks, but we've provided them with what they like, a mowed area, some water, Goose heaven. Even in the snow, you can still see them feeding. Yep, they, they do look like uh, like feathered cattle. <laughs> Alrighty, our next video, um, yes, here is a Canada goose that is feeding underwater. Boy, the water's so cool. You can see the, the feeding. Um, and the goose is more or less going after some, maybe some vegetation, some stuff that's stuck on the rock. Maybe a few invertebrates as well, too. So, um, the birds will feed underwater as well as on land. Sometimes Wherever they will they even... They'll feed. Go ahead, Bill, what's that? Wherever they can find food, they're going to feed. Absolutely. Uh, these uh, as well as swans and ducks will also tip up, which means they will put their bottoms up in the air and then put their uh, heads way underwater. And our next video is a good example of uh, swans, mute swans, uh, tipping up. There are also ducks that will do this. They're called the dabbling ducks. And I like this video because there's going to be a second swan coming in here. So just imagine the beautiful music of Swan Lake Ballet, and you've got two swans swimming along, but also tipping up, and oh, isn't this lovely? But they're feeding deep underwater uh, with their long necks, 
They can feed much deeper than a Canada goose or a goose, which has a shorter neck. And then ducks, which even have shorter necks, uh, will feed in a slightly different area. So again, three different types of waterfowl can feed in different ways. We're going to go into our dabbling ducks, which are the ducks that uh, feed by, again, either tipping up or feed at the surface of the water. Uh, there we have our beautiful wood ducks. And they're feeding at the surface. Uh, you might notice that um, the female, the one on the left, has a, some kind of, well, Bill, do you remember what that it's female it's was feeding on? That are in the water. Yeah. Okay, a plant tuber, which is a root-like structure uh, that she has gotten. It was either floating or maybe she dabbled and stuck her uh, hind end up at the air and grabbed it. Oh, it looks like she grabbed it from the surface. But you notice how they're just feeding along the edge of that marshy area uh, using their beak in the uh, plant material that's floating there. So wood ducks will eat plants, they'll eat a number of uh, uh, invertebrates, insects, snails, that type of thing. But they will also eat seeds and nuts, something as large as a small acorn. Our next couple of videos will be showing, again, a couple of other species of dabbling ducks. Uh, blue winged teal, mallard, and green winged teal. And Teal, especially the blue winged teal, have a fairly large beak. They're more closely related to shovelers, northern shovelers. But look at how this bird is moving across the surface of the water, and as it's moving along, it's all it's, it's turning, moving its head side to side. What it's doing is straining the water through its beak, and there's probably again some plant material at the surface because um, the edges of the beak have little strainers. They look like uh, the teeth of combs. They're called lamellae. And uh, they'll strain out plant material, invertebrates, insects, snails, that type of thing. Similarly, our female mallard is going to be doing the same thing. You'll be able to see her moving her head side to side as she's sifting the, through the water uh, through her beak and getting materials to eat. Yeah, very common bird. I think a lot of us have seen mallards. And uh, watch the green wing teal again as they move through the shallow waters. Again, dabbling ducks tend to like uh, shallower waters like ponds, rivers, marshes, as opposed to a, a, a big lake. And you see as this duck comes to, um, I'll call it the, whatever is at the surface, like a pond scum, um, it's moving its beak through that, straining out whatever plant material and maybe some small invertebrates that are in there as well. Beautiful green wing teal. Yeah, this was out at Sandy Ridge. Oh, always a great place to see waterfowl. Uh, believe it or not, uh, ducks will catch other things. Um, this female mallard has caught a frog. Mm -hmm. And well, it's not usual, but if this were taken in the spring, and Bill, is, again, I can't remember if you mentioned that this was a spring or a fall. I, I forgot, but it okay. was But if this were spring and she happened to come across a frog, Wow, what a smack dab uh, dinner of protein so that she could get her, her eggs formed and do really, really well. So feeding on fish and, and some uh, smaller vertebrates is good. Mallard ducklings don't even have to be taught to feed. They are what are called precocial, which means once they're hatched and dried off, they can follow mom and they feed themselves they're mobile, their eyes are open, as opposed to something like a robin who is pretty helpless. You know, the eyes are not open and they cannot feed themselves. So these ducklings are just mimicking whatever mom was feeding them. 
We're going to move into our diving ducks. And diving ducks tend to be on bigger water, you know, things like reservoirs, Lake Erie. You may even see them on big rivers as well, too. These are red-breasted mergansers, and that female has gone underwater, and she has caught a fish. And I don't know, is she going to get it down? What do you think? It's pretty big. No. Yep. Yep, it is down. Now, mergansers are interesting because all three species of mergansers, red-breasted, common, and hooded mergansers, have uh, their the little edges on their beak that are almost like teeth. They're not teeth, but they're simply uh, extensions of the edge of the beak that will help them hold slippery prey. Alrighty, I think we have another video of a of a merganser. Uh, there we go. So we yep. There we have our female merganser. She's got a fish. Oh boy, I can't wait to eat that fish. Yum oh. yum. Moving it around. Oh no! Oh. oh, that's the pits. But that's what happens when you're on Lake Erie. Uh, the gulls will just take advantage of that. That's amazing. Thanks. All right. Gulls have to eat too. <laughs> What's that, Bill? Gulls have to eat also. Yeah, they certainly do. All righty. Um, we'll take a look at uh, grebes. And um, grebes are not ducks. Uh, they are in a different group of birds. Um, they are primarily fish and small vertebrate feeders. Uh, and they dive very, very well. So this one is a a horned grebe, but we're going to take a look at a video of pied-billed grebes. And just watch as they go underwater or pop up from the water. They'll catch fish, tadpoles, uh, large insects, and they're, again, super good divers. Uh, a very different shape of beak from the horned grebe. Oh, did you just see that other grebe pop up? from the water, they can really hold their breath quite a, a long time. So when they're underwater, they're swimming, they're actively chasing their prey, and how they're able to hold their breath for so long is amazing. Uh, Pied-billed grebes have a much uh, stockier beak than the horned grebe that we saw in that introductory slide. Some Beautiful. of the diving ducks in the grebes that feed are really far behind so they can swim. We rarely see them on land. We almost always see them just on water or flying. That's that's right, Bill. That's right. Thanks so much. Hummingbirds. All right. Everybody ha loves hummingbirds. We love to have them in our gardens. We put out hummingbird feeders. And I think, you know, their smallness, their quick movement, and seemingly fearless of humans. So our very first video is of a hummingbird that will be feeding on what's a trumpet vine or trumpet creeper if you have them in your yard. This one is the yellow variety. There are also orange trumpet creepers. That long beak of the hummingbird, uh, a lot of people think, oh, it acts like a, a uh, an eyedropper where it sucks up the nectar from the base of a flower. But in reality, what the beak is, is kind of a conduit for the tongue. The tongue is actually extended, and the tongue has grooves in it. So as the tongue hits nectar, capillary action pull is, uh, 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 the nectar is pulled through capillary action. And uh, so hummingbirds will really, uh, they will pump their throats too to, again, get that tongue moving in and out. So it's not just the beak. It's also the tongue that is really doing the job here for the hummingbirds. They lap up nectar. Uh, another hummingbird magnet, and if you ever are able to get some at plant sales, this is cardinal flower. It's one of the lobelias. And they are per the uh, hummingbirds are perfect pollinators for this plant. Uh, if you watch carefully as the hummingbird visits a flower, you may notice there's two little white colored knobs from the flower that touch the hummingbird's top of the head. 
those are what the the part of the plant that's touching the bird's head are the stamens which produces the uh, pollen and so as the hummingbird visits the flower puts its head in touches those stamens the stamens touch the head that's a good shot right there you see the little dots just touching the top of the bird's head and the, the pollen is then moved from flower to flower Bees cannot reach inside uh, cardinal flowers. Uh, there, there may be some hummingbird moths, of long-tongued moths that can, but hummingbirds are the major pollinator of, of uh, the, the uh, cardinal flower. Coot. Hey, doesn't that look like a duck? It's not. It's a coot. They have really cool-looking feet. They got lobed feet instead of webbed feet. And they're vegetation feeders. So let's take a look at, at some coots uh, feeding. You can see them eating their salad. Oh, there's tipping up of a coot. They can also dive. They don't, they're not the best divers because they, they bob up to the surface really, really quickly. So coots may be associated with waterfowl. Um, you may see them uh, along with dabbling ducks because the ducks may dislodge plant material or the coots may stir up some of the things that the ducks may want to be eating. So it's, uh, I guess, birds of a feather sometimes will flock together, but they're feeding on perhaps slightly different things and in slightly different ways. So these guys are the salad eaters, as opposed to the greaves, which are the, the carnivores, the meat eaters. We did see some coots today at Coe Lake. Alrighty, we're going to move on to shorebirds. So that'll include sandpipers and plovers, dowitchers, wimbrels. Oh my goodness, there's a huge variety of shorebirds. And a huge variety of beak sizes. Uh, from short little stubby beaks to long curved beaks to tweezer-like narrow beaks. So it's amazing uh, that the shorebirds have, again, just so many different ways to feed uh, in mud, along uh, sand. So let's go to our very, very first uh, uh, video. video. There you go. And here we have a semi-palmated clover with a short stubby beak just picking up small organisms from the uh, surface of the mud. The next He's video... Kind of, go ahead, Bill. He, he has a leech, and this is out at Tanya. A leech? Cool. Our next video is one of my favorites. A purple sandpiper. And we get purple sandpipers in the winter time. Uh, Bill, do you remember where this one was taken? This was at Mentor Headlands. Mentor Headlands, all right. So the bird can swim, it can fly, it can hop, but it's searching in cracks and crevices of the rocks and whatever riprap is piled up. This bird, as I was counting when I was watching this video earlier, this bird picked in that little opening and swallowed about 13 to 15, what were they, snails of some kind perhaps? Some kind of invertebrate? This bird is just, it has found an absolute feast in that little crevice. Beautiful purple sandpiper. I think we only get them around here in the winter time. Is that right, Bill? Um, fall, fall and winter, yeah, I rarely see them in the summer, or never hear any reports in the summer. Right. You know. There were some pictures taken out on the break wall off of Wendy Park. They went on a, a, a boat ride and got some on the, uh, on the break wall, like, I think it was December or January. Sure, the break wall is a great habitat. You wouldn't think it. But, uh, but it's a great habitat because these birds will feed in nooks and crannies here. Our next video is fabulous. And I think you just got a real good glimpse, and it'll run again. Oh, Look sweet. at the size of the beak out. on this short-billed oh, dowager. And so, you know, remember the plover that we first saw had a short little stubby beak? 
the purple sandpiper slightly longer. But check out the length of the beak on this dowager and notice how it's probing into that mud. Kind of a long Sweet. beak just for a sharp billed dowager. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Our next video is, is really typical of the way dowagers feed. They always remind me of a needle of a sewing machine. So if you see a bunch of birds that go, they just probe, 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 probe. And if you see a whole bunch of them together, you'd just be like, wow. So there you go, probe, probe, probe into the mud. Almost up to their eyes. There's that sewing machine action. And a lot of these shorebirds can feel things with the tip of their beak. So they're, they're amazing that they don't even have to see anything. Uh, American woodcock. You wouldn't think of this as a shorebird because you really don't see them along like lake shores. But, you know, wet marshes, wet areas. And they have an extremely long beak. Um, many of you probably know that earthworms are one of their favorite foods and that long beak probing into the soil, uh, it has a sensitive tip and they can even open the tip of that beak almost like a little forcep without opening the entire beak. So they're, they're probing and grabbing uh, uh, earthworms without, again, without seeing them. They're simply feeling for them. By the way, we they, have are, they are in town right now. There's a lot of them out there. If you go out and dust, you may be able to hear them. Their feet. So keep your eyes and ears open. Yep. And our last shorebird is a spotted sandpiper. Uh, we can see these in uh, uh, marshes, ponds. Uh, we get them around Lake Isaac. This one happens to be stalking its prey. Look at the way it's moving and grabbing insects. This is a little more unusual. A lot of times, again, they'll be poking in the mud. But this one is, is going after uh, insects or invertebrates that might be on the plant material. Almost looking like a little, a little lion or, or cheetah stalking its prey and then grabbing at it. This is also That's the unspotted spotted sandpaper. <laughs> Yeah, that's a fall sand, uh, spotted sandpiper. Right. Yep. Oh boy, gulls. We love gulls. Yes. Well, gulls are awesome. Um, we have small gulls. We've got large gulls. And our very first video is of the smallest gull that we have, uh, the Bonaparte gull. It comes on Lake Erie, usually in the winter. This is a winter Bonaparte. Small bill, pick fish from near the surface, or uh, maybe they'll dive a little bit as they splash into the water. They'll catch some small fish at the surface. Yum. And of course, other gulls try to steal those poor little fish. Now, herring gulls are, n are not the most numerous gulls on Lake Erie. What we normally see on Long Lake Erie and even inland are ring-billed gulls. But uh, herring gulls, which are pretty good-sized birds. Yeah, so these birds are really being very polite. There's a fish that is washed up on the ice. And notice they're not squabbling at all. They're not tearing into each other. Uh, there's not a hundred bazillion other gulls trying to get the fish, so there must be plenty of food around. Um, these birds have a hooked beak, and they can tear apart a larger fish, like you see them doing there, almost raptor-like. Uh, but they will also catch small fish and, and swallow them whole. And our last gull video would be the larger, largest of the gulls that we get on the lake, the great black bat gull. And again, dead fish. You see that, that large beak of the gull with the hooked tip tearing apart that fish. 
um, they will squabble a lot, but apparently, again, in this video, Bill's got the ones that are very polite. He only <laughs> takes videos of polite guys. Well, Except ones that steal fish from the gambling. The others are standing. All right, long-legged waders. And, boy, we, there's a huge variety of these. Uh, let's get into our first video, which is an American bittern. And these birds have long legs, long necks, long beaks, but sometimes they can tuck everything in and look pretty short. I mean, look at this bittern's neck. Whoa, and the beak. Whoa, look at that. Jab. Yeah. But then once it pulls that neck in, it does not look nearly as long. The feathers cover up uh, when that neck kind of curves in. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, Bill, where was this taken? Do you recall? It's actually taken near uh, Little Met Golf Course and Little Wetland. Right, that's the famous yeah. American bittern that was very photogenic. Yes, yeah. very well camouflaged in that area, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Probably the, the long-legged wader that we're most familiar with are great blue heron. And this one, uh, with that long spear-like beak, you notice it didn't spear the fish. It caught two little fish, little tiny ones, and swallowed them whole. It, it caught, caught them both at the same time. That, that's and unusual to see, too, uh, one catch. But, it, and uh, you noticed uh, as the fish were moved down the, the beak, uh, the tongue was probably moving those fish rather than the bird, you know, gobbling it down using its beak. So, uh, again, the tongue adds a really, really important role to birds feeding. I believe we have another a great blue heron, yeah. And again, long beak, long neck, long legs. They can go deep into water. But they don't like to eat any plant material. So if they catch a fish and have a little bit of vegetation stuck to it, oh, it's like, ugh, I'm not eating my vegetables. I'm getting rid of this green stuff. Bleh. And they'll maneuver it, maneuver their prey, maneuver their prey. And they have to maneuver their prey so that the head of whatever they're eating, whether it's a fish, a frog, a tadpole, um, a snake, they have to swallow it head first. Oh, and I love this next video, which is a, a great egret, slightly smaller than a great blue heron. But just watch the way it stalks its prey and then uses its entire body to reach. Wow! So its legs were extended, its body was extended. It looked like he was doing a, a face plant in the water, but he was able to catch that fish. So again, it's amazing. If you're a fish and you think you're safe, well, not, not from this great egret. Now, if we go on, um, on land, there is a, a smaller egret called a cattle egret that can be seen in farm pastures, especially if there's cattle or some large herbivores grazing there. Uh, because cattle egrets, well, they'll, they like insects. And, you know, those, those cows or horses or whatever will stir up insects. But this bird is going to feed a very similar way to the ones walking around in the, in the wetlands. So it's got long legs, which will help it move among the grasses, a long neck, and again that long beak to help it jab and grab uh, things like uh, grasshoppers and crickets and mantids or whatever might be in the grass. 
it amazes me how the bird that white, the same with the great egret, can still survive if virtually no camouflage. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is amazing. And we've got a really small heron called a green heron, which will be in the next video. They will wade, but they like to walk around on downed logs or branches and watch for prey and then lunge for food. And again, it's amazing how long their necks are. So here's a green heron. And notice the amount of vegetation on the surface of the water, how it could even see anything below the surface. I, I don't know, but either it's able to see ripples. All right, so it's, it was able to catch, hmm, was that a frog or a tadpole? A, a tweener. Small, a tweener, okay, yeah, a small, small ta a tadpole turning into a frog. And has to maneuver that, that, um, frog is, so it's going down the throat head first. Yum eat. Oh, I hope, I hope this is making everybody hungry. As <laughs> soon as he's done, he goes on to the next one. Yep. Cool. Our next group of birds are the, the raptors vultures and hawks and owls and I think a lot of you have seen uh, raptors feeding and we're going to first have a video of some very polite turkey vultures and they too are strolling the beach oh how about that a dead fish and uh, unlike other raptors, turkey vultures do not use their feet for catching their food. Uh, they go after carrion, um, but they will use their feet to hold food uh, so that they can tear it apart. Uh, their beak is kind of similar to what that herring gull and the, the great blackback gull beaks look like. Again, for ripping, tearing, and I, again, look how polite they are. You feed first, and then I'll maybe have some of that fish after you. Now, red-shouldered hawks and red-tailed hawks uh, catch their prey with their feet, their talons. And red-shoulders like to hunt frogs. They tend to be in wooded areas where there's a stream, and this one has caught a frog. And notice how those talons are holding the frog while the bird is ripping it with its beak. But it's really using its whole body to pull up and, and tear pieces of meat from that frog. Similarly, a red-tailed hawk. Uh, this one has caught a bird. And again, holding the bird with its talons. And it will be plucking that bird and so feathers will be drifting down from wherever it's feeding and this this may be a clue as to you know what to look for so mm -hmm. let's say you are walking through the woods and you see these feathers drifting down or a bunch of feathers on the ground well don't forget to look up because you may see a raptor that is feeding uh, on it could be a bird or if it's uh, a mammal it might be fur on the ground, but again, holding the food with the talon, and then pulling up with that, with the whole body. Very common hawk in the area, I think, that most people have seen. Oh yeah, this next video is, again, one of my absolute faves. Another red-tailed hawk, and this one has caught a rat. But watch as it flies away. Ooh, look at it. Look at that cool looking rat. Ah! As it flies away, you will notice this is a very urban or suburban neighborhood that this bird has, has, has uh, caught its food. So it's either between some garages or houses or whatever, and it caught a rat, and now it's going to feed. I just think that was the coolest video. I just had to put that in there. 
And our last video is a little northern saw wet owl feeding on a, a small rodent, whether it's a mouse or a bull, but again, holding the prey with its talons. And then as it's grabbing the prey with its beak, um, just watch how it pulls up are we using its whole body to, to tear into whatever it's consuming. So this is a Cleveland Front Nature Preserve. Ah, I recognize the tree. So their beaks really aren't like scissors or a knife. It's again, they're, they're, they're more like a, a pair of pliers, and then they just kind of pull things apart. Beautiful woodpeckers. And I think a lot of people say, well, sure, woodpeckers. They use their beaks like a chisel to remove bark and dig holes into trees, but the tongues of woodpeckers are super important. And uh, really, this very first video of a uh, uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker is really interesting. And sapsuckers are, are coming in. This is a good time to see them. But you notice this bird has made a series of holes in a small sapling. And those holes are glistening because there's sap running out of them or, in the, or pooling up in those little holes. Uh, if it's a warm enough day, sometimes insects uh, are around those holes as well, coming to feed. And sapsuckers will use their uh, almost brush-like tongue is to, uh, again, dab up or swab up the, the sap that is in those sap wells. Very distinctive markings on the trees when you see a sapsucker, the sapsucker holes. A little downy woodpecker, one of our smallest woodpeckers here, with a little dainty beak going after some dainty insects. Looks like on a log. Examining small holes in the log for things. And then our largest woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker. I know many of you are familiar with the oblong shaped holes that a pileated will make excavating, but here you go, this bird is, has come back to some openings or holes that it has made maybe earlier. And as it's going uh, from hole to hole, you notice it, it kind of hesitates a little bit. And what's happening is it's putting its tongue deep into that hole. Again, the tongues of, of woodpeckers are so important. Uh, they are very long and all, uh, they have barbs at the end. So they're going after uh, insect larvae and they get stuck on those barbs and then uh, eaten, uh, uh, brought into the mouth and swallowed. Woodpeckers will also sometimes tap on trees to listen for insect movement in the trees. So even though you might say, oh, it's looking in a hole, it's probably doing more listening than looking. Oh, beautiful songbirds. Oh, we can't wait to have those come back, although robins are around and blue jays and stuff. And our very first video is of a blue jay. And this jay is not necessarily feeding, but it is gathering food. Um, probably seeds, maybe some invertebrates, probably seeds that uh, it either has cached or will be caching. C-A-C-H-E is how you pronounce that, cache. Uh, storing it away. Um, by the way, I hope you'll notice that this bird is moving around on the ground and there's a lot of leaves on the ground. Maybe you've heard this saying uh, that has come up recently, leave the leaves. So in the fall, leaves are not litter. They don't have to be picked up. Every single leaf does not have to be picked up from your yard. Leave some leaves because this is a great place for invertebrates it's to hide insect eggs. Um, birds will flip over those leaves to find food. And in the case of this blue jay, uh, either finding some, some seeds that it is hidden or we'll be hiding some seeds under the leaves. 
Jays and crows have a little throat pouch, and they can store a lot of seeds in that pouch and then catch them. Another seed eater is a black-capped chickadee. They come to your bird feeders, go after sunflowers, peanuts. Oh, but Bill, tell us what's with this black-capped uh -huh. chickadee. I don't see much it, of a black cap. It's a leucistic. It, it's a pigmentation fully developed. But it is a black-capped chickadee. He was hanging really around cool me looking. several years. Uh, about ten years ago. Wow. It's a really cool looking bird. And again, as they grab sunflower seeds, they hold the seeds with their feet. Not like talons, not like the, the hawks and the and the owls, but just to, to stabilize the seed, peck it open uh, and and uh, hold on to it to consume it. I had a black capped chickadee come to a bird feeder years ago that only had one foot. But guess what? It maneuvered a seed just as easily as a chickadee with two feet. So it's amazing what these birds can do. Our next video is a cousin to the chickadee, the tufted titmouse. And again, well, they have a slightly stouter beak. Um, and you can see that same behavior, holding the seed with the feet and either eating the seed or sometimes cracking it open. Another one of our year-round residents. You may have had some of these birds at your feeder this this uh, year, the red-breasted nuthatch. Maybe some of you have them coming still. Nuthatches, both the red-breasted and the white-breasted, will move tree down trees head first. So even if you're birding and there's the sunlight behind uh, something and all you see is a silhouette uh, and you see a bird moving down a tree head first, more than likely it is a nuthatch. And nuthatches will grab seeds from a feeder. They will take uh, small seeds, um, uh, wild uh, seeds from wild plants, and they'll tuck them in between the crevices of bark and pack them open. So. Hence the name, nut hatch, nut hack. A slightly different feeding style. A bird that will move up the tree is the brown creeper. Super well camouflaged. A very thin, slightly curved beak for probing in the cracks and crevices of tree bark. So whereas the nuthatch goes down head first, the creeper creeps up the tree head first. Primarily an insect eater, whatever. Not, not so much seeds, berries. Right, thank you. Yes, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Although I have had people that uh, say they've got it that they're um, suet. Wonderful. Alrighty. Our next video will be a, uh, a cousin of the robin. This is a wood thrush and it's feeding on the ground. Again, leave the leaves. Notice how this bird is moving leaves around, finding invertebrates, uh, worms, insect eggs. So this is, again, very, very important for the sustenance of, of a lot of the thrushes that we love to hear in the, and see in the spring. Fabulous. And then another one of our songbirds, the northern mockingbird. Um, they are kind of generalists. They'll eat insects um, during the, the time of the year when insects are more abundant. They certainly feed their young insects, but during winter and tougher times, they're going to eat, be eating plenty of fruits. And this northern mockingbird is feeding on the berries of a sumac. 
And birds that feed on fruits are very important in uh, dispersing seeds of a lot of these fruiting trees and bushes. Uh, go to places where there's a fence line and notice what's, what's growing along that fence line. Uh, here's another video of a mockingbird, again, that will be fruits. Sometimes mockingbirds will even guard uh, a, a bush to keep other uh, fruit eaters away, chasing away cedar wax wings and robins and other, other mockingbirds. Loves those berries. So once that berry is swallowed, the soft part of the berry is digested. The seed will pass through unharmed through the digestive tract. And once that bird lands on a fence, out comes the seed and they grow into another fruiting tree right along the, the fence line. Yum. That berry looked delicious. Yep. Alrighty. So we went through our songbirds. Um, Alrighty. So finches have a wide variety of beak shapes. Um, they tend to be cone shaped, but they can be short and stubby. They can be thinner. And our very first video uh, is of a red pole. So the red pole is just sitting there and eating the tiniest little seeds that are on goldenrod. Uh, again, a lot of people may not like goldenrod or some of the weedy things that are growing up. Again, these provide uh, very nutritious seeds for things like red pole, goldfinch, pine siskins. Now, red pole will eat larger seeds as well, too. But they have a thin beak for cracking open, for uh, a conical shaped beak for cracking open small seeds. Our next video uh, is a really specialized feeder. This is a white winged crossbill. And crossbills, there were some uh, that were around this past winter. Uh, Bill, do you remember where this one was taken and do you remember yep, how long this ago? This is at Lakeview, Lakeview Cemetery. This is about 10 years ago. Okay. Cemeteries are great places to watch birds. First of all, a lot of them have mature trees. Uh, this is a spruce and the uh, white-winged crossbills, as you notice, are dangling around on the, on the cones. Uh, the birds actually, the beak is actually crossed at the tip so that they can either reach under the each cone scale or eat their bite or, or take the scale off, bite it off, or again, grab the seed uh, from under the scale. So really, really specialized feeding. Not a very common bird in the area either. No, I like this video though because it really does show that specialization. And the American goldfinch as it's feeding. And once you're watching this video, um, it's digging at the base of a flower. The flower has already gone to seed, but it's, the seeds are still forming and they're still juicy and tender. So that bird is just digging into the base of where the, uh, of the flower where the seeds are forming. Uh, goldfinch do love thistle, thistle seeds, not the, not the niger seed that you put in those thistle feeders, but the actual thistle. Um, they will eat the seeds, they will use the thistle down for their nests, and goldfinch will feed their young regurgitated seeds. So again, they, they, they tend to nest a little later in the, in the uh, summer, uh, so when seeds are readily available. Snow bunting. Ah, I bet a lot of you have been out looking for these or maybe have found them. Uh, I love it when, I can't remember, I think maybe Mary Ann Romito mentioned that uh, some people have called these uh, 
toasted marshmallows. Doesn't it look like a toasted marshmallow? White, a little bit of brown, a little bit of burnt. I like my toasted marshmallows burnt a little bit. But scan those farm fields uh, when there's a little bit of snow, snow buntings, horned lark, long spurs. Watch how these birds are going to at the base of a, a, a bunch of grass. And they've actually dug into the snow a little bit to find a little seed and possibly even some invertebrates that might be hidden in that little tuft of grass. So you might think a farm field that have, doesn't have anything in it, but just that, take a little while to scan and you might just see these little toasted marshmallows feeding on some seeds uh, of some weedy species, some grasses. Ah, sparrows, little brown jobs, right? Well, yeah, most sparrows tend to be brown, but um, but again, there's some really very nice markings on many sparrows. Uh, so let's take a look at our first video of a field sparrow. And this bird has a lovely pink beak and a white eye ring, easy to identify. They tend to like a little shorter grasses. Um, they'll pick up insects and plant seeds. So our field sparrow in the short grass, moving along. And whenever you do see sparrows in grass, uh, again, scan through them. Because you may not just have one species, you may have several species of sparrow feeding together. Uh, field sparrows are a fairly small sparrow. Uh, one of our larger sparrows in the next video is the fox sparrow. And these are these are going to begin appearing shortly in spring. Watch this bird. Look at how it moves around. It's using its feet to shuffle through the leaves. Leave the leaves. Um, again, Rather than using its beak to toss leaves like the wood thrush or some of the other birds would do, this one is shuffling and a lot of sparrows will do this. They'll, they'll kind of do that little backward push and they can move a lot of vegetation around. Uh, once they find insects, uh, small seeds, again, they'll be pecking at them. A swamp sparrow aptly named, moving along the edge of a wet area, again kicking the leaves with its feet. So again, if you're out birding and you see a little brown job on the ground, rather than picking up leaves with its beak and tossing them, they're shuffling around and oh yeah, we've got to start focusing in on sparrows. So again, this is all good stuff to remember. Our final sparrow video is a, is a mixture of sparrows. There's white-throated sparrows, dark-eyed juncos, and song sparrow. Again, birds of a feather. And as these birds are moving around, um, you can see the leaves fly sometimes. And uh, like I say, they can move a lot of vegetation. Uh, now, was this at a feeding station, Bill, or was this just no. out in... Uh, out at Wendy Park in the, in the little field at Wendy Park. Excellent. You notice All most right. sparrows most sparrows don't walk; they always hop or jump. I never noticed that. Or not. Ah, that. cool. Sometimes when you see one sparrow or two of them moving around, then you start seeing more and more because they do camouflage very, very well on the ground. Yes. So fun, and I think a lot, a lot of you probably have uh, juncos that come to your feeders, and they're pretty much always feed on the ground. Our next group of birds are the blackbirds. Hey, blackbirds! Um, give them a break. They're not all, they're not bad birds. Come and take. Let's take a look at this first video of a blackbird. Actually, it's a black and orange bird. Baltimore Orioles are in the blackbird family, 
And this one is poking its beak into the flowers of a black locust tree. Um, whether it's going after insects or the nectar, because they will feed on nectar as well, as those of you who probably put up Oriole feeders or have them coming to your hummingbird feeders and spilling the, the nectar all over the place. So, um, again, that the beak that for probing for insects, but also using that tongue to help them get the uh, nectar from, from the flowers. I have Orioles that like my trumpet vines, and they can put their heads in pretty far. Our next blackbird is a red-winged blackbird. And where you see red-winged blackbirds, you often have the plant called the cattail. And this one is sitting on a cattail that has gone to, oops, has gone to seed. So it's either like the fall, winter, early spring. But as this bird is poking into that cattail fuzz, uh, it's not eating the seeds. What it's doing is putting its beak in and then opening up its mouth, uh, almost like a, a taking a pair of tweezers and, and using them backwards rather than cl clamping on it. This bird is poking in and then opening up its beak to separate those fibers out to see if it, there's some insects or, uh, or ants, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, insect eggs or invertebrates in there. So that's, this is very cool behavior. I, lo I like this video a lot. There's a lot of cattails you've been playing with out there too, if you know them. Yep. Cattail seeds are really super tiny. I, I don't even know what birds. I have seen goldfinch eat them, but they, I mean, they are really I tiny. Know, very um, the next video is of a rusty blackbird, which is often overlooked. And they really are a very pretty blackbird, about the size of a red-winged blackbird, but um, without any of the bold coloration of, you know, striping like a female or having the red and yellow. But they do have yellow eyes or a pale colored eye. And rusty blackbirds do like wet areas, so you see this one moving along a wet area, uh, actually walking in the water. Sometimes they'll even move leaves around to find Again, worms, invertebrates, uh, leeches, that type of stuff. And our final blackbird is a common grackle. Oh, and I hear so many people say they don't like these birds, but uh, I don't know if anybody can tell what this bird is, is feeding on or is caught. It's not a worm. It's got bones. That's right, it's a small snake. Yeah, how about that? So this one is part of the, just a small snake. Um, they will eat some seeds, they will eat insects, but oh, small, small snake is just as good. Sometimes they'll even put their foot on their prey, not again like a, a, a bird of prey, but just to hold it in place and then tear it apart. That, that's a pretty hefty beak on a grackle. Yes. If any of you have ever had them come to a, a bird feeder, um, yeah, they can they can go through sunflower seeds, peanuts, corn, that type of stuff. And warblers, boy. Now, this is not going to be a bird ID, but we're going to be looking at some different ways that warblers are feeding and what they're feeding on. So let's start off with our first video. And it's an oven bird feeding on the ground. Um, they walk around the forest floor. And this one has happened to find a nice moth. But, ew, I don't want to eat those fuzzy wings. So it actually removes the wings and then eats just the body of the moth. But it's so Not only is he eating, but he's tearing the wings off with his beak. Oh. So again, though, that beak can really manipulate things pretty easily. Try to take things off a moth with your mouth. We'll see how well you do. Yeah. So you see how important those leaves are. Those moths would not be there 
without those leaves being on the ground. So, this is cool. Alright, let's take a look at our next video of a bright colored warbler. I believe the other bird that we just saw was our largest warbler. Okay. The prothonotary warbler uh, is a, it's a wooded wetland nester. They actually use uh, cavities in trees that they don't build but uh, are maybe made by another species. But they, and they'll use nest boxes too. Now this warbler is feeding on insects. Once it finishes an insect, it's going to go to a leaf. And I'm not sure if you can see this really well, but it takes that beak, puts it into the leaf, opens up its beak so that leaf spreads open a little bit so it can see if there's something else stuck in that leaf. Because a lot of times insects will roll leaves closed. And so that warbler will, will actually probe in there, open the beak, and see if it can find something. So I think that's a pretty cool behavior. And they do this a lot in their wintering grounds when they're in South uh, or Central America. I think the next warbler, oh yeah, has caught a really big meal. This is a chestnut-sided warbler with that small beak. That, that is a big insect. I don't know, is he going to get it down? What is that, Bill? What kind of insect it's is that? It's a Dobson fly. A Dobson fly. Wow. <laughs> he got more than the animal. So then you can tell this bird is having some, some tough time. Uh, a lot of times these birds will, will actually yeah, uh, kind of smash the insect on a branch uh, only to maybe knock wings off, soften it up a little bit. So you may see that type of stuff too. Now we've seen a lot of warblers feeding on invertebrates or insects, but uh, check out these two yellow rump warblers, and they are feeding on berries. And this is the fall, and I'm not sure if anybody can tell me what types of berries those are. We love them. That's right, poison ivy. So these birds are really important dispersers of poison ivy uh, by eating the fruits. Um, but here's another thing too. You're out birding in the fall or the winter, and you come across a, a poison ivy vine with some fruits on it. Look for yellow rump warblers. They will be feeding on on those fruits, especially in the later fall and and throughout the winter. And we do get yellow rumps that will hang around in the winter. Not many, but they will. And that's why they feed on poison ivy bears. There's not many insects in the winter. I wonder if they get a tickly throat from eating poison ivy. Yeah. I don't think so. Nope. Alrighty. A black-throated green warbler found a large caterpillar. And, I mean, that's a big caterpillar. And as I mentioned, whoops, did it drop it? Oh, got ah, yeah. So, so large that, you know, it's having a little trouble maneuvering it, but what they need to do again is to kind of smash it against a, a branch, soften it up a little bit, although caterpillars are pretty soft, but maybe they're trying to get some of the droppings out of it that might taste kind of nasty. And our final warbler is Canada Warbler. This one, it happens to be feeding on the ground, and it too has a very large insect. That's the Dobson fly that the chestnut sided warbler drops. I'm oh, just really? Just kidding. No, no. Oh, no. oh okay. <laughs> and it swallowed that insect, wings and all. I mean, this bird is like, oh my gosh, can I even. Well,. If we let this video run a little longer, because this video is actually a little longer, um, if we didn't just take this section, um, the bird fed, gulped it down, looked around, burped a little bit, and then went to feeding again. So, man, I'll tell you, they can really pack in the, the food. 
They need to. He, he, this is in the spring, and he's about to jump over Lake Erie, probably, so they need to pack the calories on. Stuff fat is called hyperphagy, and eating. I think I have hyperphagy sometimes, too. I just want to mm -hmm. eat. And our final video is an indigo bunting. And beautiful, beautiful blue. Oh, I can't wait till they're back again. But you notice there's kind of a cone-shaped beak on that bird. They do like to feed on grass seeds, but they will eat insects and feed their young insects. But this one is feeding on the seeds of grasses. So it's clinging onto the grass and uh, going into the, the seed head of the grass. They use that beak to manipulate the hard seed coat off of the seed and then go after only the tender morsel inside. So again, beaks are amazing things for birds. That's the end of our videos that we're sharing with you. And we want to thank Bill um, with a very flattering picture and thank me you. with a very unflattering <laughs> picture. Uh, but yeah, Bill, the, the, Bill has so many videos and going through them, it has just been a delight really going through this Good. library of resources. Glad you liked it. And thank yeah. you to Betsy. Yep. Um, our next slide, please. We've had some really wonderful photos, the heading or the title photos. Uh, we want to thank everybody who's uh, provided uh, photos for that. You can watch the uh, program again. It'll be up on our YouTube um, channel. Um, but if you'd like a copy of the DVD, uh, Bill said he would be happy to uh, make a, a DVD for you. They will be $7 each. They will not have, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, they won't have this, this narration. Is that right? No narration, just no the narration. video. It'll just be the regular sounds that, that Bill has recorded along with the birds. So you might have background sounds of traffic, people talking, wind blowing, birds singing, that type of thing. Exactly. But, um, but if you'd like a copy of this DVD, uh, email info at wcaudubon.org um, and dollars each. Um, one is for expenses and the rest will be a donation to Western Cuyahoga. Well, this was a great presentation. Thank you, Bill and Nancy. Do we have time to take a few questions? Um, I, I would be happy to. Bill, do you have time? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. If anyone has any questions for Bill and Nancy, please unmute yourself. Your mute button is located in the bottom left corner of the screen. Uh, while we're waiting for folks to find their mute button, we did have a question come over uh, through the chat. Uh, Kathy Rogers wants to know, what is the difference between a green heron and an American bittern? They look so identical. So I don't know if you two want to speak uh, to any key field marks uh, that could help differentiate between the two birds? Well, the, the bittern is actually, uh, they're actually different. It, it, the bittern is not very solid. It's stripy and streaky, so that could hide in the marsh area. Where the green, I think you said green heron? It, yes. it, it is more, I don't know why they call it green heron. It looks more blue to me. But they are they are different suggest you look into a field guide and look at the difference between the two. Yeah, the green heron is is very much smaller than a bittern, uh, probably about half the size of a bittern. Um, and bitterns, as Bill mentioned, very highly camouflaged, very highly streaked. And bitterns will um, sometimes freeze uh, with their heads up so that the streaking on their, their throats and breast look like the leaves of vegetation. And if the vegetation moves, guess what? The bittern moves. So it, it does. I've, I've never seen that in real life, but that's what I have heard. Uh, also, and, bitterns seem to be more in the deep areas where the green heron, they come out in the open Oops, Bill, your, your sound faded away quite a bit. I didn't hear the end. I don't know how to change it. <laughs> 
Was there another question, uh, Michelle? Not, not a question. Uh, Janet Lloyd had a comment that I think is worth sharing. Uh, oh, thank you from okay. Pensacola, Florida. Very interesting and a wonderful group of videos. The first migrants are showing up down here, Purple Martins and Northern Perula so far, and are on their way oh. to you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yay. Push them up. Push them forward. <laughs> And then a well, lot of people just saying this is a great presentation and thank feed, you. Feed those migrants well so they'll make it up here for us to see them. Oh, Purple Martins already. Wow. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh. I have another question come in. Why must fish be um, manipulated to be eaten head first? Good question. Um, if you think about what a fish looks like and, you know, think about their fins. they got a dorsal fin with little spikes on it. They've got pectoral fins, which are the side fins with little spikes on it. If they eat uh, a fish or a frog or a lizard tail first, then the legs or the fins are going to get caught and stuck in the yep. throat. If they they're going, Yep, they, exactly. Oh, do that again, Bill. Wow, that was great. They go yeah. this way. Go yeah. so, if, so if those are fins, Think about going down a throat with little spiky things, or if it's it's the legs or the feet of an, a small animal. So head first, everything gets folded in, and it's it's swallowed it's swallowed yeah. more easily. If you ever fished and had a fish in your hands, some of their fins have little bones in in their fins, and if you get that the wrong way, it could actually hurt. It, so they need to fold those back when they go down. Yep. These are great questions. So far, that's it for the questions. Um, All right. If anyone has a question they want to ask, uh, do so now. Well, I know I just want to say thank you, everybody, for, yes. for the, you know, being here. The pr I know it ran, ran a little longer than normal, but, you know, it's really hard to to just pick this and this and this. Uh, I, I could have had three million videos. It, it could have <laughs> ran a long time. We, we could have been here till uh, Friday. How about that? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Bill and Nancy. This sure. was wonderful. Um, just a reminder, uh, April 6th, uh, next month, we have our next speaker series, uh, Cute Chicks. So hope to see you again at that time. All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, okay. Michelle. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Michelle. Bye.